Good evening and welcome to the May monthly meeting, the presentation side of things. We've already had our annual general meeting on Zoom and now we're into the monthly meeting. Uh, we have uh, Bruno who will be giving a talk. We have our new sitting president, Mr. Chris Rudge. Congratulations, Chris. Thank you. We have a very small live audience over to the side um, who might clap and cheer in the background. And uh, we also have Perry along with us for Sky for the Night uh, once Bruno's finished his talk. So I'll now pass <coughs> over to Chris to uh, do his introduction. And But before we do that, Chris, we should probably do the members, the new members. Yes, uh, could you put the new members up on the screen, please? I, I shall. Whether we can read them or not is another thing. <laughs> How many have we got for yeah. this week? Uh, we have, whoops, that's not what we want to see. That's what we want to see there. We have, oh, we're using technology I've never used before, guys. <laughs> uh, oh, that's all of our members, 1,662 members. We don't actually have the new members list, so I think we should just go to the talk, hey? We certainly have some new members. We do. And, uh, I hope you're there and uh, I hope you enjoy this talk. So new members, please make use of our facilities, of our people. Uh, come to the Dark Sky site. Hopefully we will be able to <coughs> run meetings from here, from our lodge very shortly. There's a few of us here tonight with some good technology so that we can... Uh, outreach to you guys but uh, we're a very large society as you've obviously realized and we've got people of many interests right across the range of astronomy from astrophotography to uh, radio astronomy uh, visual uh, astronomy it, it is all there and uh, tonight we've got uh, Bruno Zelke who's going to talk to us about the life of black holes. Um, it's part of his history of the, of, uh, the universe. Uh, Bruno was, is an ex-IT consultant. He was uh, into computer science and applied maths. Um, he's been 15 years part of our cosmology and astrophysics group, which is where I first met him. Um, he's read many, many books on the subject. He teaches this subject at several U3A, CA and regional libraries. Uh, he's presented to us at uh, astronomical conferences. And uh, I'll be talking to him about presenting at uh, our NACA conference next year. Mm -hmm. You didn't realise that, did you? <laughs> That's a new one on me. <laughs> and uh, he's given some 160 lectures on similar subjects. <coughs> so he is really the ASV's, one of the ASV's tame experts on cosmology. Over to you, Bruno. Good. Thank you, Chris, for the kind words and for your introduction. And um, while we're on acknowledgements, um, I would love also like to acknowledge the support that I have received from our Vice President um, here in setting up this, um, this whole presentation and the logistics related to it, and also uh, to Lee, a technical uh, director. The, you should be aware of the fact that there is more equipment in this room and outside than I've seen in a CAI spy wagon. So uh, there we go. Um, okay, I've been a member of the ISV for 15 years now, <clears throat> and I recall that when I joined, I met uh, Ross Berner, who was the, uh, the director of the uh, Cosmology and Astrophysics Group, and uh, I must re relate to you that I was enormously impressed and, uh, and motivated, uh, inspired uh, by, uh, by the sessions that, uh, that Ross had, had run. Ran, so I decided to learn more about cosmology and I started from um, studying particle physics and then quantum physics, uh, a little bit about um, Einstein's relativity, all of which come to uh, 
to some come into focus when we talk about black holes, of course. So um, with that in view, I will I will start. So um, thank you, Ross, and I have a debt to you. Right. So what is a black hole? We're going to define the the concept. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of um, of of the issue. Uh, then we're going to talk about how the black holes actually form. There's a number of different models and, and theories. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, known facts and, and some of the, the theories about black holes. I should also identify, the, uh, or rather define, the difference between theories and models. Theory is something that we, that we have to support with uh, with experiential, uh, experimental data, and also a theory is needs to be falsifiable. Whereas models, uh, whether they are mathematical, computer, or, or, or some kind of uh, guesstimates, uh, dream imagery, or <laughs> whatever, they need not be. And there lies the difference between theoretical physicists and experimental uh, physicists who, who, who are known as instrumentalists. Um, we're also going to talk a bit about the functions of uh, uh, of the uh, black hole in the uh, in the universe. So let me proceed with that. Okay. So first of all, what is a black hole? It is it is defined as a region of space where a body of mass collapsed by gravity. That body of mass could be a large cloud of gas, or it could be a star, or it could be. Uh, a neutron star which which uh, acquired mass and, and then collapsed into black hole and on your image at the top right you have uh, you have Mitchell and underneath that an aristocrat by name of Laplace <coughs> this gentleman in the end of 18th century have independent studied the, uh, the concept and of course they didn't call it a, a black hole then but they proceeded this way I need to uh, conduct a little thought experiment with you. So if you can think of throwing a stone up in the air, you expect the stone to come down to you. The question is, how fast does the stone need to go before it doesn't come back? And how much energy would it take to accelerate it to that, to that velocity? Well, these are the sort of questions that, that uh, Mitchell and Laplace have asked themselves. And I came to a conclusion that the mass of the body that can can pull light backwards, so to speak, and prevent it from from uh, escaping, would have to be very large and very dense. And I called it the black star. Fast forward to 20th century, uh, Einstein announced his announced his uh, uh, general relativity theory in 1915. And uh, in 1916, a fellow by name of Schwarzschild, who was a, a ballistics uh, uh, engineer on the Russian front, uh, he was part of the German army, instead of writing letters to, uh, to his wife, he, sp <laughs> he spent time working out Einstein's equations. Now, I have to impress upon you that solving Einstein's equations is an extremely complex and tedious procedure. First of all, um, I want you to imagine a field uh, with green undulating um, uh, hills and, um, and, and start to think of the surfaces of those uh, hills as equivalent to uh, distortion of space by body of mass, the curvature of, of space, which is distorted by a mass. Now, Schwarzschild uh, considered the equations and he thought this, for every point on, on every curve, there must be certain energy that is causing the curvature to occur. And the surface of, the, of this uh, uh, curvature is experiencing a tension. So in Einstein's equations, on the left-hand side, you have mathematical operators. Operator is just a sign, like, like two plus two, the plus is an operator or minus or divide. So the operator for the tension is known as a tensor. And the most common one used in, in uh, equations of Einstein is, is known as a Ricci tensor. On the other hand, 
on the right hand side of the Einstein's equations, you have all the all the uh, elements related to the energy, which which come from the gravitational field of, of the mass that's causing this distortion. So Schwarzschild worked it all out, and he came up with an astounding uh, um, conclusion. He said that once a star burns out all its fuel in the center, the core will no longer be able to resist the, the crash of the gravity um, um, by producing enough outward pressure, which is the result of the thermonuclear reactions which happen there. And at that point, the, 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 the core of the star will start collapsing. And once it reaches a certain uh, ratio of the original mass of the star to, to the, to the um, um, critical uh, size, uh, which is known as the Schwarzschild radius, then there is now stopping the core il collapsing into a black hole. This is very, very significant. Um, at a certain point, the uh, horizon, an event horizon forms, which is the, the imaginary skin of the black hole, and after that, there is no, no hope for anything. It just goes straight into a black hole. Fast forward 50 years towards um, to um, 1960s, uh, the first time the term black hole was used was by a Nobel Prize winner, John Wheeler, who was an outstanding physicist, and he was a physicist, physicist. He was regarded as, a, as the father of the physicist of the time. Um, and uh, you have third from the top on the right-hand side, that's a picture of uh, Schwarzschild with a big mo, and uh, John Wheeler is in the corner. Looking at the, uh, the left side here at the bottom, we have uh, Roger Penrose, who's just won um, a Nobel Prize for uh, his contributions with, uh, with Hawking, Stephen Hawking next to him. And then there's Thorne and Susskind and Malsadina. All these guys are giants of physics, um, not just related to, uh, to black hole, but they are the considered <coughs> heavyweights in, in the black hole uh, science. Okay, so how did the black holes form? First of all, at the Big Bang, there were absolute squillions of them produced, very tiny, and by tiny I mean quantum-sized. Um, and for those of you not familiar with quantum physics, we're talking about Planck's volume. Planck was a, was a physicist, the father of, uh, of uh, quantum uh, mechanics, as it was then called, and for your information, the smallest possible volume of space is one over 99 zeros of a centimeter cube. So I can't even imagine such a such a volume. But that's that's what we that's what we are talking about when we when we mention the tiny black holes produced by the Big Bang. Naturally, when when they were so small in in such high temperature, most of them evaporated instantly. But some of them managed to to merge with others and then swallow more gas. And this is how uh, some people, some physicists think that the humongous black holes, the, the super large uh, black holes have, um, have been uh, produced. There's just not enough in the life, not enough time in the life of the universe for some of the humongous super uh, large black holes to become so big. And I'm talking about billions and billions of, of solar masses. Uh, another way to produce a black hole is for a, for a large, slowly rotating gas cloud. Uh, the primordial gas cloud of, say, hydrogen and a bit of helium. Um, and this, this cloud would be larger than, than the several Milky Ways put together. And I think you know that Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. I'm talking about clouds of that size. Now, the uh, dynamics of, of a rotating cloud says that if the cloud rotates fast enough, then it has enough angular momentum to sustain itself, and anything that rotates will actually flatten, develop a core, and, and then it starts looking like a regular galaxy. But when it rotates very slowly, it doesn't have enough angular momentum, and the dark matter, of which there are five times as much as the matter within the gas cloud, is pressing upon 
the gas cloud to contract and and uh, aided by the gravity of the cloud itself it just collapses straight into into black hole um, this is all supposition at the moment and uh, and mathematical modeling another why for a and most common why for a black hole to uh, to occur if for a, is for a massive star by massive i don't mean by one that has mass but rather that is large in this particular instance so when a large star say 30 solar masses and and more stars have been known to to measure 300 and possibly up to 1000 solar masses when such a star burns all its fuel um, or most of it at least within the core, then the core no longer produces thermonuclear reactions which produce the outward pressure, in which case the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, gravity compresses the star very quickly and the core itself will collapse into a black hole. Uh, all this happens in a fraction of a second. There are a number of stages in, in this and, and while I'm presenting tonight at physics level 101, we would have to talk about 401 to discuss all the different stages. I'm sure that people in the solar uh, section at ISV know more about that. <clears throat> when galaxies merge, they, their black holes will combine. And uh, um, this has now been measured in 2015 with, um, with the um, special gravitational um, uh, instruments. Um, another way for black hole to, to come into existence is when a neutron star, um, well, let me start again. The most common uh, configuration of stars um, is a binary configuration. So you have two stars uh, of relative size, or one bigger than the other, and for one reason or another, uh, matter of mass or, or whatever, one of them collapses first. And depending on its mass, it might collapse perhaps into a neutron star. Say if it's 10 times as large as the, as the sun, it will go into a neutron star. Now, that neutron star, if it's close enough to the other star, starts sucking gas off, off the, uh, the remaining star. It acquires more mass and collapses into a black hole. So there are, there are three stages, um, as it were. Uh, there's the, the original star, and if it's small enough, like our sun, the core will simply collapse into a white dwarf. If it's larger than, say, eight or ten times uh, solar mass, it'll collapse into a neutron star. And if it's 20, 30 times, it'll go into a black hole. Um, neutron stars tend to merge together. And with the combined mass, they have enough mass now to collapse into a black hole. So these, these are the, the known ways in which black holes are created. Here we have an artist's impression of two black holes. You can see one on the left and a smaller one on the right. And I included that to show you that when black holes are in proximity of one another, they tend to rotate around a common uh, center of gravity and they exude um, gravitational waves. They are depicted here in this diagram. In fact, uh, just before they merge, uh, they violently disturb the, disturb the actual fabric of uh, of space, and they they emanate so much um, energy in the gravitational waves that about ten percent of the total uh, mass of the two is is lost through that. Um, yeah, I spoke about the uh, the. Um, cloud of gas collapsing. Here's an illustration. This, this particular cloud, as, in you, as you can see in the top uh, left-hand corner, is rotating counterclockwise. Now, um, the primordial clouds of gas will first start contracting a little bit, and they form filaments. And when there's a little bit of matter, more matter gets attracted to it. It's sort of like streams streams tend to um, join into, into a river. It's the same thing here. But the cloud will have an uneven distribution of, of the mass. So if there's more mass at the left-hand side, for example, than the right, 
then it'll start the rotating around its uh, center of gravity. That's how the rotation start. Once it acquires angular momentum, it, it starts spinning faster and faster, and the faster it spins, the more it flattens, and eventually it, it finish up, finishes up looking like the, the uh, picture in the center here, where um, a very large black hole uh, forms, um, or perhaps it's organically merged with others, and it gravitates towards the center of gravity of, of, the, uh, of the galaxy. Not all galaxies have, have a black hole in the center, but most do. The one in the middle of uh, Milky Way measures about 4 million solar masses. But if the cloud, as I mentioned, does not rotate fast enough, then chances are it will collapse into a black hole. Th this has not been tested. It's, a, it's simply a proposition. I have a, a picture here of how stellar black holes are created. Stellar meaning the, the original star collapses into a black hole. So on the left side of the diagram, we have a very small star like our sun, which has a, a stellar mass of one, one solar mass, so to speak. And uh, the uh, pink nebula shown here is is the birthright of um, of of stars um, very much like the uh, the pleiades uh, the nature of stars are such that um, when when the when they are when there's more and more gravity and uh, pressing upon uh, the uh, uh, a region of, of gas, it collapses more and more and more. And as it, as it collapses, it, it increases its pressure and, that, and thus temperature. You probably know very well the temperature is defined by the number of interactions of molecules of the gas, uh, and the number of uh, collisions between them. Uh, a single photon, for instance, might have enormous energy, but it has no temperature. So as the temperature of, uh, of a particular region of or compressed gas rises, it starts to glow. And then once it reaches about 10 million degrees Kelvin, the first level of thermonuclear reactions occur. Proton to proton um, collisions happen and they, they produce um, de deuterium and, and so on. I won't go into the, the physics of that because that's, that's uh, two levels um, lower down. But eventually the star contracts enough that it starts producing helium. It is, it is at that point that it fires up like a real star and, uh, and it, it blows away all the gas around itself and from then on the star is born and it doesn't change its mass. It, it, this is where its clock starts as it were. So it, it um, goes along on its merry way, consuming hydrogen, then, then, then converting to helium, consuming helium and then heavier gases like oxygen and ta ta ta. Um, our sun does not go very far, probably produces oxygen and, and silicon. Um, and then eventually when, when most of the available fuel in the core uh, is uh, uh, used up, it'll blow up into a red giant and probably the uh, circumference of the star will go past the orbit of Earth. More likely it is imagined that it will vaporize all the oceans and kill all life on them. So we, we have a few years to get out of town. Um, the core then collapses into a white dwarf which is made of oxygen and, uh, uh, and carbon, uh, affectionately known as liquid diamonds and it produces a very pretty little uh, uh, nebula, sometimes called planetary nebula. So the, the reminder, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, is a white dwarf. This is what our sun will finish up in about four and a half billion years or so. Um, the larger star, <clears throat> the, more, the massive stars, are the blue giants. Uh, they also start from a, from a cloud and coalesce in the same way, uh, and they become a protostar and then finally the thermonuclear reactions fire up in full swing and the massive star is born. The brighter the star, the more blue, I think you all know that. 
Well, in the same manner, the massive star goes through its life cycle and burns uh, hydrogen and then helium and then silicon and ta 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 and goes on like that. And then towards the, uh, the uh, mature life, it also blows up to a super red giant. And this is where the very heavy elements that we know of, uh, like plutonium and, and uh, iron and, and gold and platinum and so on, uh, are made. Now, and then it, um, the core collapses either into a neutron star, depending on the, on, the, on the mass of the original star, or if it's bigger still, it collapses into, into a black hole. And that collapsing stage is very complicated. I'll show it to you in the next slide what actually happens. But the, the star explodes. Um, the gas rushes in, bounces off in a, in a fiery uh, uh, shell known as a supernova. So this is how the massive stars die. They, they finish up as neutron star or a black hole, whereas smaller stars like the sun finish up as a white dwarf. Okay, a little bit of physics here. At the top left-hand corner, you have a diagram showing the core in blue with thermonuclear reactions um, occurring there. What does that mean, thermonuclear reactions? It means that protons are crashing into each other. One in a billion collisions actually are head on, whereas most of the others bounce off, which are known as elastic collisions. And even when they are head on, our star does not have enough oomph, as it were, to make them stick. Think of Velcro. If Velcro uh, surfaces are far away, nothing happens, but bring them together and, and they stick. This sticking together is due to something called quantum tunneling. Now, their fields, and of which there are 24 different fields in, in, the, uh, in the particle physics, their fields already overlap when they are very close. And, and, and if they stay there long enough, they actually do stick because the, the uh, fields quantum, the energy quantum tunnels from one region to another. Uh, that's, that's all I'll say about that. However, so when two protons collide, um, a lot of um, energy is released. And during that process, one of the constituents of the protons, and I should mention that a proton consists of uh, two up quarks and one down quark. One of those up quarks, by absorption of an electron, gets promoted to a down quark. Now, a neutron normally has two down quarks and one up quark. So you can now see that the only difference between proton and neutron is that one uh, is the difference between one up quark and one down quark. The, and, and when in all this violence uh, going on in the, at the core of the star, um, this, this happens quite often, despite the one in a billion chance, because there's so much of it going on. So now we have a, a proton and a neutron uh, stuck together, which is known as uh, deuteron or deuterium. And then um, through the further stages, um, it progresses to helium-3 and then helium-4. It's at that stage that the, the sunshine, which we call the visible light, is actually produced. But I don't want to dwell on the on the physics of it, rather I want to show you the actual process of the implosion of the star. So, so here we have gravity uh, compressing the star and, and the thermonuclear reactions, the heat and the, and the outward pressure holding the gravity uh, at bay. And um, when some of the fuel is consumed in the middle, the gravity compresses the star at the core, it heats it up more thermonuclear reactions occur, and so the pressure increases. And so the star pulsates like this throughout its life. Our sun uh, has a lifetime of 10 billion years, and it, we're about halfway through. So now, when in a, if talking about a larger star, star now, um, let's say we are now towards the end of the, the life of the star, 
there's now more fuel to be extracted from the center. Uh, all the uh, heavy gases have been produced, silicon and so on, and the star starts producing nickel-56 and, and possibly iron, iron ash. The, um, the feature of, of both nickel-56 and, and iron is such that the, their uh, structure is so tightly wound that energy cannot be extracted from it. What that means now is there is no more energy to be given from, from the core, so gravity wakes up and says, hello, I got you now, and boom, it, it uh, compresses the, the core, and depending upon the size of the, the star, it, it, it will now collapse to the Schwarzschild uh, radius. Now, the second diagram at the top shows you the, uh, the pressure of the gravity and the collapsing gas towards the center. There's a vacuum created because the, the, the core has collapsed, so the gases nearby gases rush in, and so do the outer gas, uh, gases. Of course, when there's so much traffic going in, eventually the compression at the, at the uh, core is so, so high that, that it, cannot, it cannot go any further. So this high compression creates temperatures of about 100 billion degrees Kelvin. And it's at that point that all the heavy elements are once, once again created. Um, we have an abundance of uh, free protons, free neutrons, and, uh, and uh, electrons and all kinds of whiz-bang particles. And this is the moment at which they are able to combine into very heavy nuclei. So what happens now? The shock wave traveling outwards stalls for a moment because the gas is rushing in, resist the shock wave from traveling outwards. There are several stages in that, and I won't go into the details of that, but enough said that eventually the shock wave overcomes the, the resistance of the gravity, and in the bottom right-hand corner, the shock wave travels outside of the perimeter of the original size of the star. From there on, it travels um, very, very fast outwards, and it produces a very colorful nebula. Um, yeah, in, the, uh, in this picture here on the left, I have two computer simulations. The one at the top uh, left-hand corner shows the actual moment when the black hole was created. And so much gas is, is, is going into the, the black hole that it chokes, literally chokes. It can't consume it so fast. So it, it, it coughs, as it were, and the blue um, jets on, on each side are the actual ejections of the unconsumed uh, gas and, and matter. Whereas the, uh, the orange um, and the inner brownish sort of area around the core is the beginning of, of the shock wave. Um, gathering. Now, in the video that I will show, it'll tell you that all this happens in microseconds. So, the black hole is consuming its star before the star actually died. Okay? Now, on the right-hand side, we have examples of some supernovas, uh, the, the nebulas produced by the supernovas many years afterwards. I think you are familiar with this. You probably photographed them in your time. And on, on the left-hand bottom side, we have a computer simulation of, of the two. Okay. How are we doing for time? Am I going too fast? Too slow? All is well. Okay. The, the only thing that determines what happens to a star, how does it die, is dependent upon its initial mass. The larger the star, the more likely it'll collapse into a black hole. The smaller one, the more likely it'll become a white dwarf. So here we have a, a picture at the top uh, upper part of a, um, a white, white dwarf, which, um, which burns very brightly for, and it'll continue to do so for about a trillion years or so. And around it, there's a nebula of gas which, which ejected from the, from the mother star. Um, at bottom um, left, we have um, a neutron star. Um, <clears throat> this particular neutron star 
uh, is known as a pulsar, and I should explain what that means. Uh, there are two concepts to be explained here. The original star will either rotate anti-clockwise or, 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 or clockwise. And just like a skater on ice with the arms out, uh, rotating slowly, when the skater pulls its arms close together to, to herself, uh, her body will start rotating faster. It's the same thing with the collapsed core of a star. And the original star rotates slowly, but the core will rotate very much faster. Some stars which collapse into neutron stars uh, ro originally rotated so fast that the core rotates extremely fast, up to some 700 times per second, and some estimated a thousand times per second is possible, but generally a lot slower than that, 30 to, to 20 times. Now, the, the gas ejected uh, at each magnetic pole, the south and the north as it were, um, is acting like a, a lighthouse, and should that beam be pointing at Earth, we experience uh, pulses which go past our, our detectors. That's why it's called a pulsar. On the, on the right-hand side, we have almost the same thing, except we have a, we have a black hole and, uh, ejecting much of the gas which, is, which, is, um, which has been attracted to it. And I should point out that black holes don't suck. Things have to, the, the molecules, and the particles in the accretion disk around the black hole need to collide with one another, change direction, and fall in. But if a large star happens to be by and gets spaghettified by the, by the gravity of the black hole, then it'll be eventually become part of the accretion disk. And as it gets closer and closer to the to the edge of the black hole, known as the event horizon, the, the energy of it increases close to the speed of light, and, uh, and uh, much of that uh, gas is actually rejected by up to 60, 70, 80 percent sometime, depend upon the, the speed of the, uh, the reaction, and it's ejected in enormous uh, jets. And these jets travel for, for hundreds of thousands of, of light years away. So if such a black hole is rotating, and its jet is uh, is pointing towards Earth, then we also experience these, these pulses. Um, except this time, we call it a quasar. I'll, uh, I'll talk about this some more in a moment. Okay, I mentioned a, a neutron star, uh, which is the first of the binary stars to collapse into a core collapsing into a neutron star. It now eats the gas. This is this is an artist impression, of course, uh, much prettier than it actually looks in real life. Um, and eventually, when it acquires enough mass, it the core of it will actually collapse into into a black hole. I should mention that a neutron star is called a neutron star because it is made almost entirely of neutrons. It has an atmosphere of about five centimeters where there's a little bit of, of uh, gas around it. And this is the gas that's being ejected causing, causing this, uh, these jets. Uh, for your information, um, a proton, um, let me rephrase that, um, an atom of hydrogen with one proton and one electron is so empty that if the proton was in this room where I'm sitting, the nearest, this electron would be in Ballarat. So, because we are built of, of these things, then you can say that we are, we are mostly made up of empty space. Not so in a neutron star. The neutrons are densely packed together, and one spoonful of such matter of the neutron star weighs at least a billion kilograms. That gives you a, a feeling for how how um, how densely packed. Now you may ask yourself, how come when it's so densely packed, it doesn't collapse into into a, a black hole? And that is because of something no, uh, known as a, as neutron degeneracy. Degeneracy is a fancy word for repulsion. All protons uh, and all 
uh, neutrons and everything that it's made of, like uh, quarks because of something and, so uh, and uh, even lab known such as, uh, uh, as neutron uh, uh, electrons, uh, muons, and pow, are all so the quarks and the leptons are collectively known uh, as fermions. And all and fermionic uh, neutrons repel everything other. that it's made they of, like, uh, because of something uh, uh, and uh, even lab known such as electrons, muons, and having the same spin, so the same. Angular momentum and the same energy as fermions uh, cannot all stay and in a neutron repel everything that is made of it. Because so some fermions uh, can even uh, let them say as, as electrons and uh, neutrons uh, having the same uh, spin do not collapse so into a blank angular momentum because they can be a neutron repel all fermions and neutron repel everything that is made of it. It's enough to keep them where it is and even let them say as electrons and neutrons having not enough mass and not enough to collapse into a black hole. I have an illustration here of how, um, this is a computer simulation of course, on the left hand side of how the neutron stars actually emerge and they create, they disturb the um, fabric of space as you can see in the top right hand corner, uh, they create, um, they create um, these holes in the, in the fabric. Eventually when they merge as in bottom left um, and before that they create gravitational waves. Now these are not to be confused with electromagnetic waves or, or any other uh, waves whatsoever. They are purely made by the by the rotating masses disturbing the the um, fabric of uh, of space and they are gravitational waves. They are very very tiny. We are, we are talking about a fraction of a diameter of a proton. Now, they travel with the speed of light, and um, I'll say more about that in a minute. So that's uh, two neutron stars merging into, into a black hole. When two galaxies collide, as Andromeda and Milky Way will um, collide in some billions of years, two things will happen, three things will happen. First of all, the dark matter, which is surrounding both of the uh, uh, both of the galaxies, will pass through with very little disturbance or none whatsoever. However, the 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 matter contained, the gas and the stars and so on, will undergo very violent tidal waves. It is unlikely that that um, stars like our sun or similar will be stripped of their planets, but the inter intergalactic uh, turbulence will be enormous. As you can see, uh, the mother, or the larger of the galaxies shown in, in yellow here, is the one that attracted the one that is that is being spaghettified, st stripped and, so to speak, uh, made to circle the accretion disk of uh, of that galaxy. Now if each galaxy had a black hole then eventually the black holes will merge and produce a larger black hole. So that's that's another <clears throat> stage in the process of creation of black holes. In our Milky Way we have hundreds of black holes if not thousands. Many of them have been observed but in the center there's a black hole known as Sagittarius R and astronomers tell me that the reason why it's called uh, Sagittarius is because um, the arm in which R in coincides with the uh, constellation of Sagittarius. I'm, I'm not much of an astronomer so I have to take that on faith. So the name has stuck and, and our black hole is known as SGR star. It weighs in at 4 million solar masses and uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom illustration you can see trajectories of stars that are going around the uh, black hole and uh, this is one way of knowing, even if there were no accretion disk around the, uh, the, the black hole, of knowing that there's a large mass, um, a large center of gravity around which all these stars are, are going. You can actually calculate from their, from their uh, uh, cycles uh, the orbits and the speed, the mass and the rotation uh, of the um, of the black hole, and which way it rotates as well. Most most black holes have an electric charge. Most of them rotate, and of course, all of them have have mass. Now, 
there's a, a cloud affectionately known as a G2 approaching our uh, black hole. Our Sagittarius R black hole is currently dormant. It doesn't have any jets. It's not eating anything. It's, it's quiet, asleep, possibly hibernating. And uh, when that black hole, uh, the uh, G2 cloud approaches, there will be lots of fireworks. The jets will, will wake up and most of the, uh, the cloud, the gas of the cloud will be, will be ejected into, into those huge jets. So that's a, a Milky Way. Now, I mentioned the quasar before, and uh, this um, diagram here illustrates three different ways of, of looking a galaxy with a black hole uh, and the jets which possibly can be seen from Earth. If the galaxy is seen by us edge on, as is the Milky Way, then we call it a radio galaxy with jets. If, on the other hand, the galaxy is tilted towards us at some uh, angle, then it is known as a quasar. If it's coming, if the beam is coming directly towards us, it is known as a blazer. It's just a, a convention of um, of naming, perhaps. So, it, in any case, it it acts like a like a lighthouse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that uh, black holes come in various sizes, from microscopic to to massive, uh, supermassive, and then ginormous. Now, the most um, absent size is the middle one. In fact, um, they've discovered recently um, black holes of, of about 60 plus solar masses, which is very, very unusual. Um, we either have supermassive billions of, uh, of uh, solar masses or we have uh, smaller ones like 10, 15, 20 and so on, but not 50, 60. In fact, there is a, uh, there is, um, a perceived limit of how big a black hole can become, which is based on, uh, which bases its origin in a in an explosion of a star. And I think they kind of put it around 50 to 60 um, solar masses. Now this particular one, known as S5014 plus 81, um, for some reason I don't understand, is a supermassive black hole in, and it weighs in at 40 billion solar masses. Now I just want to impress upon you the, the scale of this thing. Here in the center you, you will see a, a little dot, red dot in the middle, that's our sun, and the tiny little circle around it is the orbit of Pluto. So the radius of this black hole is 37 times larger than the orbit of, of Pluto. Now, the uh, classical wisdom of the black holes is that the density of such a black hole at the beginning is so, so uh, small, so loose, that if you cross the event horizon, you wouldn't know that you've actually crossed it. Nothing would happen to you. Whereas if the black hole was very small, you'd probably be vaporized instantly. So this is a very large uh, black hole, and until recently, that was the largest one known. But um, I believe that last year, astronomers have found a TON-618, which uh, is estimated at about 66 billion solar masses. You should appreciate that when some objects, uh, astronomical object, is further and further away, then the error in measurement of anything at all, mass, rotation, and, and charge, um, uh, rises so exponentially, so the error increases with uh, with distance. Um, so this this uh, sixty six billion is a very rough estimate. Okay. Now let's talk about the accretion disk itself. Um, the popular science articles will tell you that uh, black holes swallow whole stars and they attract lots of matter and all that. Yes, the gravitational field field of the black hole causes uh, a distortion in space 
and it makes um, a, a, it causes attraction of uh, of other material to to follow towards the common gravitational center. But to actually cross the event horizon, that's another matter altogether. What actually happens is the gravitational field of the um, of the black hole will cause the all the, the gas of, say, a captured star to be uh, spaghettified at first and then eventually settling into a, a donut around the black hole itself. The inner part of it um, is known as ergosphere, which is, which is the, the area in which of space which is dragged around uh, with the uh, rotating black hole. This is technically known as frame dragging. So particles which, uh, which actually fall into the inner part of the, uh, of the accretion disk uh, need to collide with one another to, to, to fall in. Okay, there's a lot more about that, but I'll, I'll go move on. Now, way back in, uh, in the earlier part of um, 20th century, um, a female scientist um, by name of uh, Emma Nerda, N-O-E-T-H-E-R, Nerda with a umlaut, I believe, over the O. Because she's a woman, she could not be given a professorial uh, status at any university. And uh, eventually she was uh, granted an honorary title, but, um, but she wasn't paid. Now, this lady established the principles of conservation of energy, of mass, of charge, and of information, some of which are no longer valid. For instance, we, we probably still think in Newtonian types of, uh, of uh, uh, frame of mind, where we think that time flows the same on Earth as it does on Uranus and on Saturn, but we know very well that time is different in Brisbane as it is in Melbourne. Um, in the same way, we think of, uh, of, uh, um, of energy and, uh, as an entity which cannot be created and cannot be conserved. That is no longer true. Uh, you may have heard of something called dark energy. Dark energy is the energy that causes the uh, universe to accelerate its, uh, its expansion. It is technically uh, referred to by physicists as a property of space. Now, this is a little difficult to internalize, and I have serious problems with that. The more space is created by the expansion of, of the universe, the more energy of the dark energy comes into being. So much so that the dark energy density is, is level at all times. Now, that is completely contrary to the principle of conservation of energy. So that's one example why energy is not no longer conserved. Electric charge is conserved, uh, angular momentum is still conserved, and so is information. And I want to talk about information a little bit. Hawking predicted that information related to the particles that fall into a black hole is lost. What do we mean by information? Now, popular science writers will, will write nonsense such as if you throw a, an encyclopedia into a black hole and eventually the block will ev evaporate, it'll spit out the, uh, the encyclopedia. Nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, the only inform, um, information that we are talking about is the quantum, intrinsic quantum properties of each uh, elementary particles, such as quark, lepton, or a boson, or a Higgs particle. And this refer to spin, energy, and angular momentum. No other information enters this, this uh, equation here. So when these particles fall into the black hole, what happens to the information? It is considered now that that information is retained in some form, either electric or magnetic, here represented by ones and zeros on the, on the skin, so to speak, the virtual skin of the black hole known as the event horizon. And there's been much arguing to and fro 
where the energy is conserved. There is no final um, conclusion on this, but most physicists now feel that uh, that, the en that the information is actually conserved. The mathematics say that it is. Okay. Um, on the left-hand side here, you have the popular representations of a black hole and how it disturbs the fabric of, uh, of space. You've probably seen pictures of heavy balls being, or heavy ball being placed in the middle of trampoline or some, some rubber ball. And then when you, when you spin a smaller ball, it'll go in some kind of uh, concentric uh, shapes and eventually finish up in, in the center. Well, nothing further is further from the truth because we need to think of a black hole as a three-dimensional body. In fact, four-dimensional body uh, represented in three dimensions of space. The black hole is, is virtually circular. As it rotates, depending upon the speed at which it rotates, it'll flatten a little bit on the poles, whether it goes clockwise or anticlockwise. And shown on the right-hand side here, we have the ergosphere. Ergosphere from the old Greek word meaning work. Work is being done here. So this is a sphere in, in which work is being done. Uh, force is being um, acted upon the, the, the uh, fabric of space around the black hole. And so it drags the frames around with it. That's, that's what it really means. So the presence of energy or mass in space creates gravitational field. This is the basic sort of concept. Uh, at the moment, we take it as a given or philosophically known as a priority, a priori. And it is the mass itself that shapes the structure of the space around it. And then the space around it tells objects, other objects, how to move in this, in this field, distorted field. So it's a sort of a symbiotic relationship, as it were. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the geometry of a black hole. Um, I'm giving you information here which is uh, taught in universities right now, but the real science of the structure of the black hole has gone way past it now, and I'll briefly mention that. So here we have in uh, purple the extremities of the black hole, the, the actual... Um, ergosphere in which the uh, accretion disk is, um, is situated and then in yellow we have the outer horizon event horizon now this outer horizon is actually the limit of the the outer limit of the black hole the radius of that uh, circle shown in yellow is the Schwarzschild radius once that uh, that radius, depending upon on the size of the original star, the bigger the star, the bigger the radius. But once that ratio uh, is crossed in a collapsing core of a star, then the black hole is born. Then we have another inner horizon, and this is where the more complicated physics happen. Um, it is considered that it is in between the outer horizon and the inner horizon that the physics change. Matter is converted into pure energy and the spatial dimension is convert, transformed into a temporal dimension. What it means is that if you're heading towards the singularity, you don't ask where is the singularity, rather you ask when. For people like me who grew up common sense um, arrived through the senses and all other classical type of Newtonian physics, this is something that's very difficult to internalize. But this is what, what the physicists are, are saying now. Now, I want to introduce you to even a, a stranger concept uh, proposed by the string theorists. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with string theory, um, um, the particle physicists, uh, quantum particle physicists, consider that the smallest particles, elementary particles, are quarks, 
gluons and, and leptons. String theories say that many, many levels of, of size below that are something called membranes. These membranes are two-dimensional membranes which can be very large in the universe and, and they live in the fifth dimension and they are strings attached to the, to the membrane. If, if I represent a membrane by, by this sheet over here, then um, the, uh, uh, the strings will be attached perhaps at one end and vibrate loose with the other end being loose, or they may form a loop. And some st string theorists uh, suggest that gravity comes from this, uh, from those looped um, strings, and that theory is known as loop quantum gravity. It's a fairly advanced theory, and it's probably the closest we have to to the uh, holy grail of physics, the uh, the quantum gravity, which is necessary to marry um, the two and explain the the differences between predictions of the um, Einstein's um, uh, general relativity and the quantum um, theory on the other hand. So here we have a, a diagram, um, uh, artistic impression <clears throat> of the multidimensionality of the, of the ring uh, of, of singularity. Now, uh, Einsteinian uh, equations uh, were converging like, like this. And um, even though Einstein himself didn't believe it, the equations are saying that, uh, that this, the uh, equations cause converging results and eventually all matter in the black hole converge into an infinitesimally small volume. Naturally, that makes absolutely no sense to anybody because uh, neither space nor matter can be compressed beyond Planck's volume. So eventually, it cannot be compressed anymore. So infinitesimal volume is, is a nonsense. Also, you cannot put infinite amount of energy into, uh, into infinitesimal amount of volume as, as is supposed to happen during the Big Bang. So that's another problem. But for those of you who are, who are leaning towards quant uh, quantum physics rather than relativity, quantum... Uh, <laughs> quantum field theory doesn't have any better explanation uh, than that and and their theory breaks down somewhere somewhere near the the, the center of the uh, black hole this is why they have an indeterminate and messy uh, ring like singularity rather than a point now um, I'm given a sign here so I have to hurry up a little bit um, on the left-hand side, you have a representation by the general theory of relativity where, um, where the structure of the in interior of the black hole is very smooth and everything is concentrated in, in the sing point singularity. On the other hand, quantum field theory says that it's textures and gradual, um, so the two do not agree. Uh, on top of that, the temperature uh, of, a, of an average black hole is estimated about 1 over 17 zeros over Kelvin. And as long as there's temperature, there's movement. As long as there's movement, time does not stop. I'll progress a little bit. Uh, we are familiar by now with the orange uh, uh, ergosphere, the external um, uh, singularity, the interior, and the and the uh, singularity shown in green in the middle. What is new here are the two photon sphere. Now, if you look at the, uh, the black hole side on, the magnetic field at the North Pole will go, let's say, this way, and on the South Pole, it'll go the opposite way. So the parts of the accretion disk will be attracted uh, at the bottom, as it were, towards the South Pole going in the opposite direction and the others um, in the upper direction. Hence, we have two jets, one above and one below. If they are, are only photons circulating, then they will, they will circulate in opposite directions to one another. I'm nearly at the end. 
and I want to introduce to you a completely new concept here of a white black a white hole. Black hole is something that things fall into and never come out. White hole, on the other hand, shown at the bottom, is the exact opposite. Things come out, but they cannot go in. So Einstein and um, and Rosen considered there may be some way of connecting the two together. Now, if you imagine two black holes very far apart uh, in space, and by some uh, agent of technology or whatever, or magic, you can make that space bend upon itself like that, then the two black holes will be very close to one another, forming a tunnel in between, a conduit. And they called it the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Today we call it a wormhole. Now there's, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, wormholes and, and uh, traveling in the past and all that sort of jazz. I won't, I won't dw dwell on that. The gray hole is a technical term for the, for the area in between outer and inner horizons where uh, processes uh, of exchanging the uh, uh, dimensions of spatial into, into temporal and matter energy to pure energy are not well understood. This is Hawking's term. Okay, so in summary, um, just a quick review. A black hole is a region of space where body of mass collapsed by gravity. Black holes are, are normally electrically charged. They are rotate, they have event horizons. They come in various sizes from minuscule to supermassive. They can be formed by a, a gas cloud merger of stars and merger of galaxies. They radiate much energy via gravitational waves when merging. The black holes have been confirmed by observations now. They've been imaged rather than photographed. And the two main theories, general relativity and quantum mechanics, disagree on geometry of uh, structure, information retirement, and many, many other issues. In the remaining few moments, I'd like to show you some uh, uh, supernovas, which are a result of the collapsing um, uh, cores. And I hope you can see this on the screen now. Can you start the, uh, yeah. The, there's about three seconds per, per slide, so it'll take a, a moment. Some of these, of course, are artistic impressions, like that one, that's a magnetar, a very fast rotating uh, neutron star. But these, these are apparently astronomical images which have been observed. As astronomers, I imagine some of you might have actually photographed these. <clears throat> the colors, of course, are false to, my, to sell magazines. Uh, this is probably what our uh, Milky Well will look like. And that's Eta Carina, a very large star, which had two supernova explosions already. That's another artistic impression. As you can see, they are very impressive and very colorful. So Bruno... I think that's it. Can I show a two minutes movie? Um, we're probably a little bit short on time. I really want to show you really want to show? Yes, I insist, please. Lee can hear us if he can get that uh, movie. Lee, up. can you get the movie started, please? And then, we've, while that's running, do you mind if I pop up a couple? Of, or is there audio for that? Is there? Yes, there is audio. Yes. I hope they can. They can hear it. Yeah. So we've got a, a couple of questions that I'm going to pop up yeah, for you to answer. This, this goes on for two minutes. That's okay. It's a very impressive video. It's strange that we can't hear it. Why can't we hear it? Oh, the audio is set to go out, not ah, to, to not come to us. Yeah. Okay. Not for us to hear. It's more than a billion miles across. This is fantastic video. That. It describes what happens inside the star, and it describes how the core actually goes off. We can show it to you in a minute. The star's extreme gravity crushes inward. For a few million years, fusion and gravity are locked in standoff. But when the star runs out of fuel, 
fusion stops, and the stalemate ends. Gravity wins. In a millisecond, the core shrinks to a fraction of its original size, and a baby black hole is born. Immediately, it starts to cannibalize what's left of the star. As matter swirls into the black hole, it gets incredibly hot, and there are magnetic forces and frictional forces, and it's just a witch's brew, a nightmare, what's going on right above the surface of the black hole. The new black hole in the middle keeps feeding on the body of the star around it. It eats the gas so fast, it chokes and coughs, blasting out huge beams of energy. They basically eat their way out from the star. This happens in milliseconds. It happens before the rest of the star even knows the core is gone. And so basically the star is dead before it hits the ground. Finally, the star explodes. In one second, it blasts out a hundred times more energy than our sun will produce over its entire life. What's left is a new black hole and two jets of energy hurtling through the universe at the speed of light. These jets are called gamma ray bursts. They're incredibly energetic events. In terms of raw energy and power, gamma ray bursts are second only to the Big Bang itself. Most of them last only a few seconds, and they fry anything in their way. We have a couple of, I've noticed a couple of interesting questions, just some quick answers if we can. Okay. Uh, we have Brenton Rashid has uh, asked, stars like Betelgeuse, do you think that will end its life ultimately, ultimately as a black hole or is it too small? Um, Betelgeuse is a very large star and um, I don't recall its actual mass, but it's considered to be a, a large star. It's actually a, a super red giant and it's already pulsating, giving it pre-death um, sort of indications. But then again, Betelgeuse has, has been doing this uh, for some time. So when in an astronomical sense, we say that it's very soon, it could be uh, uh, several thousand years. Okay, and then one last one we've got here is from uh, Gunnar. What is known about how, about how the density increases from the ergosphere into the center of a black hole? Uh, that really depends on how much gas there, there is. Uh, okay, the, this, there are two questions. First of all, how does the density increase from the event horizon towards the center of the, of the uh, uh, black hole? And of course, nothing like that has ever been measured. It, it can only be estimated mathematically. So we only have computer models and maths models. But the density of the uh, accretion disk very much depends on the amount of uh, gas that there is in the accretion disk itself. So it varies. There is no, no uh, standard formula for that. I could pass over to Chris to... Bruno, thank you so much for such an interesting uh, talk. It was really excellent and it has raised many questions in my mind about how little I do know, and uh, I think I'll be coming back to uh, astrophysics and cosmology to learn some more. Uh, Bruno regularly contributes to those uh, meetings, along with uh, Ross Berner, Ross Berner yeah. and uh, they can be very interesting and a very good way to spend an evening. So thank you, Bruno. Thank you for your time well, and thank your you effort. For... And it's a very good, excellent way of educating us all. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present it too. Good. Now we uh, will cut to Perry. And I'm sorry, Perry, we have a fairly <laughs> short time left. As, uh,
you know, ran you a can, little over. You can me. you can blame me, Jerry. Well, I blame, talk too much. <laughs> well, blame Bruno for that one, but um, <laughs> it was very hard to stop where it uh, until it came to its conclusion. So a very quick sky for the night, uh, Perry, please. Can we cut to Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Bruno. Fascinating talk. I learned something in there as well. I'm sure many others did. Um, seeing we're running way over time, I'll just make a couple of comments. I was going to do a, a new segment of Constellation of the Month, which was... Um, something I was going to introduce again after many years, but I'll just cut it down to a couple of things and leave the constellation of the month till next month. Um, the Eater Aquarids is the first thing I want to mention, and that is unfortunately a very disappointing Eater Aquarids this year. The reports that I saw of this particular meteor shower uh, have ranged from people that saw zero meteors to as many as about half a dozen. So it was uh, a poor showing this year, and I might say that the report of zero meteors came in from me. After watching for an hour, I saw nothing. Anyhow, the other thing that we should all uh, look forward to, and this is a big ticket item, astronomically speaking, is the total eclipse of the moon that's coming up uh, later this month on Wednesday the 26th. Now, if you've got this magnificent book and all of you should have it because it's the astronom the ASB astronomical yearbook on page 40 you will see a wonderful depiction by our erstwhile editor Jim Katsafolis of the lunar eclipse now it will be occurring in the eastern sky uh, the moonrise will be about the same time as the sunset. Uh, three minutes after five is when the moon will begin rising and the eclipse will begin at 6.47 p.m. Now, mid-eclipse will be uh, 18 minutes past nine and the whole thing will end at a reasonably user-friendly time of uh, 10 minutes to 12 to midnight. However, this is one of the shortest lunar eclipses that I can ever recall. So if you're going to be doing photography or observing of the, the lunar eclipse, You've got 15 minutes of totality, which is particularly short, and um, you need to be ready for it when it happens. The other thing is I've already had some inquiries as to where the best spot to go to see the eclipse is. Well, you don't have to leave the city to see an eclipse of the moon. Many people were talking about going out into the desert and the mountains, and really none of that needs to occur because the eclipse of the moon is equally well seen everywhere on the night side of the earth and does not suffer much from light pollution at all. So, don't need to go anywhere. Your backyard is as good as uh, any other place for looking at this particular total eclipse of the moon. And don't forget, you've got 15 minutes for totality. 
Whether it will go red or not has a lot to do with the amount of dust in the Earth's atmosphere from things such as volcanic eruptions and the like. I've not had a look at what the volcanism has been like recently, but the more dust there is in the atmosphere, the redder it's likely to go. And in fact, a total eclipse of the moon is more or less giving us a report card on our atmosphere. So I won't go much further, Chris, and uh, we'll wind it up there so that we can all get there reasonably early. Yeah. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, Perry. I'm hoping everyone can still hear me. Yes, yeah, I've got, uh, got some nice headphones on now. <laughs> um, sorry, got some guys in the background talking. Now, the next uh, monthly meeting is scheduled for June the 9th, but as Perry mentioned, we've got the lunar eclipse coming up on the 26th of May, and we have a live event uh, with tickets still available at Caulfield Racecourse Reserve, um, so they are limited. So if you want to grab a ticket for that event, they're free. Uh, gold coin donation on the night. We also have on June the 2nd um, our second beer astronomy event at uh, Tiny's Bar and Bottle Shop. So tickets are on the, the links to the tickets are on our Facebook and our website. And we also have wine under the stars at Shiraz Republic on the 26th of June. Uh, once again, tickets are off for those, that event uh, are on the website and Facebook as well. Um, so, Chris, if there's anything you need, you'd like to add, uh, I think we can close out the meeting. Thank you all for attending, and I hope you enjoyed all the meeting. Bruno's talk I thought was exceptional and uh, we will certainly look forward to seeing you at further events. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.